Hello and welcome to Shark Week. I was very excited to hear that in Monterey Bay in California you can see juvenile great white sharks. This is because the Thomas family are going on holiday there and we hope to see them. But this has not always been the case and the reason as to why they are there is a little less exciting. During the 2014 to 2016 North Pacific marine heat wave, juvenile great white sharks were recorded off the coast of Santa Cruz. Juvenile sharks which are defined as being less than 2.5 metres in body length, live in coastal nurseries, and in this part of the world were historically found in the waters of northern Mexico and southern California, with the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula being their southernmost range. However, in 2014 they moved northward. These sightings off Santa Cruz coincided with an increase in water temperature. A warm mass of surface water described as the Pacific Warm Anomaly, a nicknamed the Blob, entered the area. In fact, warmer sea surface temperatures have persisted in this area, as it has in many other areas of the world's oceans. A study published in February this year has established that since 2014, more than half of the ocean surface has experienced extreme heat on a regular basis, and that these new temperatures are now considered normal. The consequence of this is that the habitats suitable for marine plants and animals will shift into different areas, having a huge economic and ecological impact on marine regions. This will lead to changes in food webs and ultimately lead to the collapse of what were stable marine ecosystems such as coral reefs, seagrass meadows and kelp forests. This is what's happened in Monterey Bay. The cold limit of the juvenile sharks range has shifted position northwards from an average of 34 degrees north in 1982 to 2013 to 38.5 degrees north. The area that is thermally suitable for them has also decreased at a rate of 223.2 kilometers squared per year from 1982 to 2019 and was lowest in 2015 at the peak of the heat wave. For juvenile great whites, the temperature of the water around them is important. Whilst they are endothermic, meaning that they can generate their own heat. Due to the greater surface area to volume ratios in juveniles, they have a cold limit to their thermal range. So what is the consequence of this move northwards by the juveniles on the Californian coastal environment? Well, there have been an increasing number of otters dying of shark bites in the waters of Monterey Bay. In the early 1900s, there were only around 50 otters left, and now, Thanks to the protection from the International Fur Treaty of 1911 and the US Endangered Species Act, there are around 3,100 individuals. But they have only reoccupied 13% of their historic range and expansion has stalled over the past 20 years. Many are dying as a result of the great white shark bites and it is thought that this is why the population is not increasing further. Both adult and juvenile great white sharks will bite otters, but they don't consume them. At birth, great white sharks are what we call piscivorous, that is they feed on fish. This is when they are restricted to the warm shallow waters such as their new habitat in Monterey Bay. At around three to four years of age, the juvenile sharks move to the cooler waters of central California. Their metabolic demands are higher now, needing more fuel to enable them to thermoregulate in these colder waters. In the autumn, Great white sharks are commonly seen in aggregations near the elephant seal colonies found along the coast of central California. These elephant seals have a lot of blubber, and I mean a lot. They are huge and are the preferred prey of the adult great white sharks. So why are the great white sharks bothering with the otters and biting them? They are not very calorific, as they have no blubber. They keep themselves warm using their thick fur. In fact, it is believed that the sharks don't even like to eat them due to the fur, and although they have bitten them, they have not even been partially consumed. It is thought that the otters are being investigated by the sharks, and then left when they realise they don't actually want to eat them. Unfortunately for the otter, that can mean an infection, leading to death. The northward expansion of the juvenile sharks corresponds with an increase in otter deaths due to shark bites. Initially, it was thought that the bites were due to the adult great white sharks, arriving in central California on their autumn annual migration looking for the elephant seals. But the sea otters are now being bitten by great white sharks throughout the calendar year, when the adults are not in the area, and it is consistent with an increase in the juvenile sharks seen in the warm shallow waters. 
This increase in great white shark bites has become the single biggest reason for the death of otters, limiting their ability to expand in numbers. I will be doing another video on this in the near future. Sea otters are vital to the health of kelp forests. Sea urchins eat kelp, chewing through the stalks and killing them. Without the otters preying upon the herbivorous sea urchins, the urchins decimate a kelp forest, leaving behind an urchin barren. And kelp forests are vital to the health of our oceans, providing important habitats for other species, as well as a carbon sink and for wave attenuation. So this increase in mortality due to shark bites is not a good thing for the otters or the kelp ecosystem, and ultimately not for us either. Climate change is also affecting shark development. A study was carried out on the epaulette shark, Hemicillium oscillatum, a species of long-tailed carpet shark which lives in shallow tropical waters to determine the growth and development of its embryonic and neonate stages were affected by increasing temperatures. It is found in tropical shallow water and it is oviparous, meaning it lays eggs which hatch outside of the body. The species is known to be resilient to challenging conditions as it can hunt in isolated tidal pools which have large fluctuations in temperature and oxygen levels, which makes it a conservative indicator species for chondrichthyans, the cartilaginous fish. And as the researchers say, if epaulette sharks cannot cope with thermal stress, how will other, less tolerant species fare? Researchers reared eggs at temperatures of 27, 29 and 31 degrees Celsius and found that the embryonic and neonatal survival rate was not affected. 100% of the eggs hatched and rearing temperatures did not affect neonate length or body condition. However, various other interesting and alarming observations were made. Embryonic growth rates and yolk consumption were faster for embryos reared both at 29 and 31 degrees Celsius when compared to embryos reared at 27 degrees Celsius. The fastest incubation period was at 31 degrees Celsius and increased with decreasing temperature and sharks hatched at a lighter mass when incubated at 31 degrees Celsius but there was no difference between those incubated at 27 and 29 degrees Celsius. There was also a significant relationship between temperature and the time to recover following exercise. Neonates reared at 27 degrees Celsius required an average of 71 plus or minus 5 minutes to recover from exercise. Those reared at 29 degrees Celsius needed 107 plus or minus 7 minutes to recover. And those reared at 31 degrees Celsius required 138 plus or minus 6 minutes. This is nearly a doubling in recovery time with a 4 degrees Celsius increase in rearing temperature. Given all this data, the scientists concluded under future ocean warming scenarios the epaulette shark habitats could become too warm to support proper growth and development for embryos, neonates and juveniles. And it can be inferred from this data that other species of tropical oviparous chondrichthyan species will also experience temperatures at their upper thermal limit. If these top predators disappear from our oceans, the consequences to the health of our oceans will be dramatic. The impact of the removal of a top predator is already being felt in Western Australia's Shark Bay. The tiger shark population in this area has plummeted by 70%, not due to climate change, but as a result of overfishing and bycatch. The tiger sharks prey upon dugons, which feed upon the seagrass. Scientists modelled what would happen if the population of tiger sharks went extinct. And, of course, the dugon population goes up, and the amount of seagrass rapidly goes down, which also affects the population of other animals which rely upon it. Another point to consider is that seagrass is an important carbon sink. It accounts for 10% of the ocean's capacity to store carbon and it captures carbon from the atmosphere up to 35 times faster than tropical rainforests, so it is vital that we protect it. The interdependence of an organism on others in its ecosystem simply amazes me and the importance of these top predators is becoming increasingly evident. We humans have shifted the balance of predator-prey interactions in our marine ecosystems by removing them or altering their range. And whilst it is truly remarkable and a privilege to have seen these majestic creatures off the coast of Monterey, I hope that they will eventually return to their usual latitude. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, subscribe 
and share with your like-minded friends. And look out for the next video on sharks coming out this week about the White Shark Cafe.